Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Emerging Nuclear Medicine and PET CT Imaging Trends, Optimizing Diagnostic Assessment and Therapeutic Interventions. I will now turn the presentation over to our moderator, Dr. Elliot Siegel, Rad Site Standards Chair Committee. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. I, I, I appreciate it. And um, it's really a, a pleasure. I'm very much looking forward to uh, moderating and, and learning um, during the, uh, the session. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so as uh, Julie mentioned, I am uh, the uh, moderator um, of the uh, session, Elliot Siegel, and I am uh, Standards Committee Chair. It's my privilege to uh, introduce uh, Angela Graber, the uh, Vice President, and uh, um, uh, she does uh, operations for uh, Digirad, and then also Kay Castle, um, who's the Corporate Radiation Safety Officer for Acumen. And so um, I think, you know, both of you have really unique perspectives and represent, you know, really large organizations that are doing a lot of interesting things in, um, in nuclear medicine. And I think, you know, here we are um, it, towards the end of 2022, and I think it's really timely for us to uh, look back a little bit at um, some of the uh, history of nuclear medicine and where we might be going in the future, and then maybe to talk about some interesting topics. So uh, next slide, please, Julie. So um, I guess might not be a bad idea to just start out with, you know, what is nuclear medicine? And uh, I think there's some confusion among patients and among clinicians uh, often of uh, exactly how does nuclear medicine fit in with uh, CT um, and MR scans and x-ray studies. Um, I think it's important to uh, recall that nuclear medicine really has much more of an emphasis on functional imaging uh, rather than anatomic imaging, although it does provide some combination of both. Whereas um, CT and MR and X-ray tend to have more of an emphasis uh, primarily on um, anatomy, um, although there is definitely some overlap between the two. Nuclear medicine uh, has, has had a long history and Nuclear medicine has actually been around significantly longer than CT uh, or MRI. Um, and uh, nuclear medicine has evolved tremendously over time with some of the earliest studies being done for uh, thyroid imaging and then um, bone imaging. And um, one of the really early developments in, in nuclear medicine has been the use of uh, I-131 therapy for treating patients with uh, hyperthyroidism, particularly Graves' disease, and also um, for doing ablation for cancer. And as time has <clears throat> gone on, <clears throat> we've been able to add many different radiopharmaceuticals uh, to our armamentarium for uh, nuclear medicine for um, both uh, diagnostic purposes and also for uh, treatment. Um, one of the biggest developments in nuclear medicine was the uh, transition from planar imaging uh, in one plane that was analogous to a um, X-ray study to uh, SPECT imaging, single photon emission computed tomography, where we were able to rotate a nuclear medicine uh, camera around a patient and be able to collect information, you know, manner very analogous to uh, CT scanning, and so. Um, the history of nuclear medicine is really um, fascinating. Uh, PET CT scanning um, has been uh, introduced and been become very, very um, popular and utilized in the last 10 to 20 years. And it's really, in many ways, revolutionized um, nuclear medicine and revitalized nuclear medicine in so many ways also. Um, there is information that we get from uh, FDG PET scanning, for example, that is pretty much unique and is very different than the information we get from uh, CT or MR or other types of scans. And uh, within the uh, positron emission tomography area, there are many new radiopharmaceuticals that are really coming out you know, every few years. And uh, so I think that's been really exciting. I think nuclear medicine, which um, is really identifying itself now as combining with uh, molecular imaging, um, has 
become a really um, very uh, vital and uh, is something that is uh, continuing to grow and uh, continuing to be more important, uh, particularly um, as we're doing PET scanning and as we bring out some of these new radiopharmaceuticals. Um, but you know, uh, SPECT studies still represent the uh, majority of nuclear medicine studies being done at this point, and uh, the technology continues to evolve and get better. And so, uh, Angela or uh, uh, Cade, any comments um, about where you see nuclear medicine's current situation? And uh, how about the future, five years, 10 years from now, based on your perspectives, you know, where do you think we're, we're, uh, we're going with nuclear medicine? Well, Dr. Siegel, I think you really hit it on the nose when you said the word evolving because, uh, you know, nuclear medicine really has come a long way since the beginning days. And from my perspective right now is one of the most exciting times that I've seen in the nuclear medicine field. Um, we have a lot of new radio pharmaceuticals that and are- when you say um, we, become... could you maybe just give a little bit of an intro to your company also, just so people can become a little familiar with it and- what your, where your perspective is coming from? Of course. So I'm the corporate radio, uh, radiation safety officer with Acumen. Um, we are a combination of uh, fixed site, multi-modality uh, imaging centers, and a, a large portion of mobile PET CT providers across the nation. Um, we're on, in almost every state across the nation right now. So I get kind of a good mix of the general nuclear medicine field and then uh, PET CT um, from our mobile. Thanks. And please go and ahead I, about where you see nuclear medicine being now and where you see it going. Of course. So we are seeing a lot of new radio pharmaceuticals that are coming through and um, becoming FDA approved a lot over the last couple of years. And there are a lot more um, through the pipeline there that will be coming along the way. Um, and, you know, it all goes kind of in through uh, theranostics and um, some of the targeted radiotherapies that will be that are already available and will be um, more available coming soon. Um, and I also see the introduction you, of. I was just going to say, when you mentioned the term theranostics, not, not everybody may be familiar with that. And, you know, it's sort of the hottest area within nuclear medicine. You want to just say what, what theranostics means from your perspective? From my perspective, it's kind of combining the diagnostics um, that we are used to with targeted therapies for um, specific patient outcomes and improved clinical outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. We can target uh, the, the, the direction of the clinical um, therapy for the patient based on what we see in our diagnostics. Mm -hmm. And are there any pharmaceuticals that you're particularly excited about or, or therapies, you know, now or, or, or in the future? Uh, well, there, right now we have several imaging agents for PSMA that are um, currently available that are very exciting. A couple of different ones. Um, we have some neuroendocrine imaging agents that are pretty recent that are um, new to the field. And, and those are, um, becoming more and more popular. And then yes. we have uh, therapy agents. Uh, Ludothera is coming out that um, I think you'll see more and more in our nuclear medicine department. For neuroendocrine tumor therapy. Correct. Yes. And uh, so um, do you think the future is bright for nuclear medicine or, you know, there, there've been many kind of predictions of uh, sort of doom and gloom for nuclear medicine that it was going to be supplanted by other areas. But what, what's your impression now? And what do you think about the, uh, the future for, for nuclear medicine? I absolutely think that the future is bright. I mean, I see, especially in the PET CT realm, things really expanding with the mm -hmm. new radio pharmaceuticals. Um, I think there's an overall trend to individualize um, diagnostic imaging and um, clinical outcomes to specific patient outcomes, and, and we can play a big part in that. Great, well, well thanks. Um, Angela, do you, uh, could you maybe just 
give a little bit of an introduction to Digirad and what Digirad does and maybe give your perspective a little bit about where we are with nuclear medicine and where you think we're going from, from where you sit. Of course. So um, I am with Digirad. We are a mobile imaging provider. We focus predominantly in, in uh, cardiac spec imaging. Uh, we also manufacture our own uh, mobile cameras as well as fixed uh, cameras for um, the nuclear space. And we also have a division that services uh, a wide range of nuclear imaging equipment as well. Um, well, for from Digirad's perspective, I'll say that the current situation um, for nuclear medicine and uh, we're seeing a lot more PET being utilized, definitely, but I do not think that uh, cardiac spect imaging is going anywhere. I think that we will see um, advancements in equipment. And I, I also believe that we will uh, begin to see advancements with the delivery of PET and, and hopefully, you know, the way that we're able to get the doses, maybe hopefully make it a much more accessible um, form of imaging moving forward. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity for advancement in both equipment and uh, dose delivery. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. So it, it sounds like, um, you know, you share, um, the uh, optimism as, as far as uh, where nuclear medicine is going to be going. So that, that's Absolutely. terrific. Uh, ne next slide, please. So uh, um, how about artificial intelligence? I mean, I, I just came back from the uh, Radiologic Society of North America meeting and you know the SNMMI meeting uh, uh, in, during the summer and artificial intelligence seems to be like something, you know, that everybody's talking about and, and nobody's doing essentially. and and <laughs> You know, where do you think we are um, currently? I'm gonna um, stay with you first, Angela, as far as AI and, you know, what is uh, Digirad thinking with regard to uh, AI applications? You know, we've seen it, it utilized in other forms of imaging. We have not um, been able to, to utilize AI yet, you know, in, in our modality. Um, and in our cameras, but you know, definitely something that we're looking into, and what what would it take to to get us to that level and be able to um, you know utilize this this tool that is becoming much more um, utilized in in imaging across all spectrums. So um, yeah, I mean, I would think as a manufacturer the potential mm -hmm. to be able to use AI for noise reduction, the possibility of being able to use AI for, you know, dose reduction or reduction in imaging times. I know there's one third party vendor that takes images that have already been created and then utilizes AI to try and reduce noise or, or improve the uh, quality of the images. And then, you know, they're suggesting that one could potentially scan you know, at half the dose or at, you know, half the time for acquisition, which sounds huge. And so, you know, I guess for, um, for Digirad, there's the possibility of you being the provider of the AI as part of how you build the systems, but also you're putting add-ons maybe in, you know, in one way AI, you know, as an add-on to improve the image quality or reduce dose or acquisition time. But you know, another is helping with diagnosis. I mean, you, you have so many cardiac systems that are out there right. and I'm starting to see more and more in the literature um, publications related to predictive models. You know, show me the polar maps or show me the right. images and I will predict, you know, what this patient's likelihood is of developing a major cardiac event or um, I'll be able to uh, make other predictions based on the images that might be things that the computer might have, I mean, that a human might have difficulty doing. So I know, you know, there's a, a huge amount of excitement um, overall for that capability. So uh, it's good Absolutely. to hear that, that you're looking at that because you've got so much control from the, you know, manufacturing, the servicing, it just seems like AI applications could potentially really be a, a major game changer um, in that, and I'm sure, you know, reducing acquisition times in half or patient doses, you know, would, would have immediate applications. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Very exciting opportunities. In the yeah. Agree. Okay. So we have a couple of pilot uh, locations where we're using a software package that does decrease imaging time. Um, and we're work we have worked through some of the changes in workflow for those patients. Um, it seems to be working out fairly well. Um, I, I don't think we have, um, I don't think I've seen the other software changes or um, add-ons that are helping with um, Im image interpretation so much, but on the front end for image um, acquisition, we are seeing that um, it's working out pretty well. Um, and, and the imaging times are reduced by about half. So like I said, there are some changes with workflow when it comes to managing those patients, if they're gonna be um, finished quicker. Um, and some changes with, um, especially in PET-CT, where those circulating patients are going to be while they're circulating um, with the radiopharmaceutical. You know, from my perspective, it's a little bit of a regulatory challenge to make sure that we're um, not exposing the public to more than we're allowed to when we have several patients in a specific area that are circulating all at the same time. So I guess my ending with my comments that um, definitely are beginning to see artificial intelligence out there. Um, we are beginning to use it and it seems to be advantageous to our workflows to be able to um, especially help those patients that are maybe nervous about the scan or nervous about being in the scanner for 25 minutes, say. Um, we've been able to reduce those scan times by about half. Um, or also, you know, for patients that are in pain or uncomfortable and can't finish a longer scan, it certainly is advantageous to them. Yeah. And, and do you see further applications? In other words, you, we've been talking about dose reduction and decreased scan timing in particular, what other ways do you think AI might be useful for your practice? Well, in other modalities, we're starting to use it for oversight of say a technologist with uh, remote um, access to more than one scanner. So that's another way that we're starting to see that um, come into play, not so much in the nuclear medicine field, but in, in MRI, we're starting to see that as well. Okay. Excellent. Uh, you know, some people have used uh, AI as uh, a mechanism to be able to track or predict no-shows, for mm -hmm. example, and, um, you know, to use AI for so many different types of applications. We've talked about dose reduction, um, and we've talked about um, decreased scanning time, decreased noise, but there's also the potential to be able to more efficiently generate um, nuclear medicine reports. One of the vendors is offering the ability to create a report and then use AI to essentially automatically generate the impression. And uh, so they claim that's a 25% time saver. Um, others are looking at um, creating um, impressions or, or create um, diagnoses that are um, potentially helping radiologists uh, decrease their uh, miss rate for a variety of different um, findings in nuclear medicine and otherwise. I actually uh, have recently uh, published a couple of uh, um, seminars where I've been uh, one of the uh, editors looking at a very wide variety of different applications in uh, being able to do um, PET um, uh, AI um, imaging. And so, uh, you know, quite a variety of of many different um, ways that um, AI can be used to make a diagnosis, improve images, uh, particularly in patients with uh, um, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, AI has played a huge role at this point um, with regard to uh, pet research, and it would be great to see more of those in clinical operation also. So um, on next slide, please. So I'm not seeing the, the slides on my display for some reason. Sure. We, yeah, just uh, covering some of the challenges that are being experienced in, in the oh, nuclear okay. medicine field right now. 
Yeah. Do you want to address some of those? Sure. Yeah. I think that probably um, most places around the country have experienced um, a lot of the challenges post COVID that um, have, have impacted all, all different levels of facilities. I know for us, Specifically, um, there's been a significant shortage of nuclear medicine technologists that uh, has impacted the business and and how we're learning to uh, adjust and adapt to the shortages that we're seeing. I think over the the period of COVID, there was you know a lot of programs that were shut down, so there was a, a area of time that we weren't producing new nuclear medicine technologists. So while we're working through that, um, that lag time and they're starting to come out more now, but a lot of the technologists that we are trying to recruit, it has been much more challenging. I think that um, definitely changes in, in the marketplace and um, a lot of, the salaries have significantly changed with the needs of the hospitals um, and we're having to make adjustments to maybe the um, how many days of imaging are provided at certain facilities or how we're scheduling days to accommodate for the shortage of, of technologists. Do you know um, quantitatively or, or do you have an idea of whether or not there are fewer technologists that are training now and you know our is nuclear medicine as a society you know looking to increase those numbers and are there strategies do you think fewer people are looking to go into um you know school um for training for nuclear medicine technology or you know what are some of the strategies and is your company doing anything to look at ways to be able to attract folks to the uh, to the field yeah, for us, we're we're looking to um, we're working with the schools directly, and so we're trying to make more of a presence uh, within these programs, and uh, we're providing demos for our, our cameras. Um, we're look, we're recruiting within these facilities and schools, so uh, as well as looking to be, we're investigating how to become you know, clinical facilities in on some of these locations. So mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that the number in the schools has decreased. I think that the lag time where the schools were closed, you know, has had a significant impact over the last two years. Okay, thanks. Um, and then, you know, as far as remote technologists go, would, would you both mind commenting a, a little bit on the idea of either kind of one expert tech who may have additional expertise in PET CT or might have expertise in cardiac imaging, you know, might be able to help out other nuclear medicine techs who might not be subspecialized in that area or the whole idea of having AIDS in nuclear medicine. And so, you know, if I have somebody who's not a technologist, but um, I do have a technologist there. Um, could that one technologist be able to work in two rooms or three rooms or four rooms potentially with that technologist doing all the injections, but AIDS learning to be able to monitor patients and being able to actually um, interact with the systems and, and do many other things. Are, are you both seeing that in your practice and where do you think that's gonna be going in the next few years? I think I read somewhere that 50% of the current technologists are over the age of 50 right now. So I think mm. that these, I think that these are some of the things that we're going to have to tackle in the near future, whether, you know, whether we're ready for that or not, you know, I think you're going to have probably a lead tech or um, an expert tech who's overseeing a couple of tech aides at one time and having them, um, you know, hold up some of the load as much as, as much as possible. Um, I, I think that's just the way that it's going to have to go. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that brings up the next question, which is what would the qualifications be for an aid? Are either of you using aids in your practice already? And if you're already using aids, then how do you train them and, and how do you qualify them? And 
you know, how does one determine what one can do and, and not? I, mean, I, I think we'd all agree from a state um, regulatory perspective and probably patient care that the AIDS would not be injecting or handling the radiopharmaceuticals per se, but there's so many other jobs of the, uh, of the technologists. And so, you know, um, how would one determine in, in your practices or um, otherwise, um, you know, what are the training criteria? Should they be, you know, um, standardized across multiple practices? Um, and, uh, you know, what should AIDS potentially be, uh, be doing? And would you pretty much think that AIDS could do anything other than the direct handling and injection of radiopharmaceuticals? So we are currently using tech aids. We call them patient coordinators at most of our mobile sites anyway. Patient coordinators, um, they okay. Do, patient coordinators, they do have a training um, regimen that they go through with clinical you know, competencies for each um, job that they're you know, tasked with. They do mm -hmm. help a lot with shuffling patients around, especially in the mobile environment. You know, we move patients from inside the facility out to the imaging truck and then back in to go to the restroom. Um, right. They help with a lot of the screening paperwork and explanation of the exams to the patients. You know, there's a lot of things that they can really, that they can really help us with. Okay. Interesting. And, and so I guess at some point, the question would be, would one have some sort of registration for AIDS or, you know, do you think, do either of you think that AIDS ought to be um, something that um, is defined maybe by, you know, the, the technologist um, societies as far as, you know, what they would do and how they would get certified? Or do you both think that should really mainly be up to the practices themselves and that they should take that responsibility rather than there being um, an official sort of training course or designation or certification as uh, nuclear medicine aids? I think with, with nuclear medicine, it, it's kind of a hard, there's a hard line that has to be drawn where the, the tech aid really isn't able to help with the actual imaging or the handling of radioactive materials, you know, regulatory wise, we're, we're pretty constrained there. Um, so I'm not sure that certification would be helpful as much as say in other fields where a certification okay. would really be more valuable. Um, okay. So you think we should leave I, it up to the individual practices then? Yeah, I know that, um, the SNMMI technologist section is there. They have a task force pulled together to look at this right now. And I'm not sure that they, you know, they have a technologist advocacy group for uh, certification, but I'm not sure that they do for say a tech aid position. Um, okay. I think, I think that we're so bound by regulatory constraints. I'm not sure that it would be helpful to have them um, hmm. be certified. Okay. Well, well, thanks. Let, let me move on to another one of the uh, the challenges that we have listed, and that's the um, potential shortage of radiopharmaceuticals. So we've lived through, you know, shortages of molybdenum, which have impacted technetium, which of course impact cardiac scanning and a variety of others. Um, you know, where do you see that today, and where do you both see that going um, in the in the future? And are there ways that we can you know, protect ourselves and, and what have you done as strategies when you've found yourself short? If, if you had, if you knew that you really were gonna have a challenge getting tech protectinate, for example, um, for the next, you know, month, then, you know, how are you coping with that? And um, are your supply supplies coming from one vendor or have you looked at, you know, creating multi-vendor supplies? There was a issue with, um, intravenous contrast with CT with one of the vendors and the people who had used other vendors were not impacted at all. And so, you know, how do you see strategies moving forward to deal with potential challenges associated with the fact that there's so relatively few providers of radiopharmaceuticals? Yeah. So we are just coming off of a, a shortage that spend approximately a month. Um, yeah. So it, it did have a, a very large impact on the business. We've been able to utilize, you know, different um, 
different suppliers. So in a lot of them, it might be local to that market. Um, so we've, we've expanded our, our network of providers and have that helped us tremendously, you know, get through get through this shortage but mm -hmm. in addition we've had to kind of restrict schedules um we've had to cancel some days a lot of times we just restrict the volumes um on specific days depending on the capabilities of the pharmacies to produce and what they were able to provide it, it was pretty much a day-to-day -day basis but mm -hmm. i feel like you know with the limited um suppliers there's always going to be that that possibility you know if one it's it's usually scheduled maintenance that ends up being down and and that it's it's just a snowball effect when when that happens so unfortunately this one lasted a pretty good almost a month so i think it will continue and hopefully few and far between but I yeah don't. but i don't think anybody's optimistic enough to <laughs> think that we won't be having them in the future. So exactly. it sounds like what you're doing makes sense. I know, you know, we um, have at the Baltimore VA Medical Center and University of Maryland, I mean, we've looked at, you know, alternatives to doing studies. I mean, can one do fluorine PET, for example, instead mm -hmm. of a bone scan? Can we do, you know, PET imaging and in, um, instead of maybe some of the myocardial perfusion um, studies? And, and, you know, so looking at maybe substitute studies in the uh, short term and, and, you know, then I, I guess um, the strategy of having more providers, you know, really um, gives you more options. Although, you know, of course they're all limited by the um, number of ultimate, you know, manufacturers that they have. Okay. Any other comments about, about the uh, um, ready pharmaceutical yeah, shortage? One. I just sure. have one comment. There is an emerging technology to produce Molly generators that are non-uranium based. So there's yes. um, electron accelerator based Molly generators that are, there's some on the market already, but we hope that that um, expands because we've seen just how fragile that supply chain is right now. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that's going to be available in the next short number of years? Do you see that as a medium or long-term thing? I, I know you were saying that there are some already, but I mean, not in my area, at least at, at this point, and, and I've read about it, but I'm not sure how, you know, what, if we really had a shortage, you know, how ready we are with those um, new, you know, mechanisms for manufacturing molybdenum. Right, I don't think that we're really ready at all right now, mm -hmm. because I just don't think that we have the network space for yeah. it, and I'm not sure that it's cost effective either right now, but. Um, okay. At least it's out there. Yeah, good. A any other thoughts about that, or any other challenges that that we haven't um, talked about? You know, with regard to shortages of technologists and remote techs, and um, the ready pharmaceutical shortage. Um, anything else that you all see as major challenges to to your practice? Not. I think those are the big ones. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, I know if I had to rank them, you know, our, our biggest issues are really continuing technology shortages and the fact that it just seems that technologists, at least in our geographic area, you know, mainly are just kind of, you know, recruited from one facility to the other yeah, um, with a limited number and uh, not a lot of new ones coming in. And you mentioned the statistic about, you know, what a relatively high proportion of our technologist workforce is above the age of 50. And Clearly, you know, that seems to be uh, um, increasing as time goes on. So, um, so thanks. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as far as the technology, um, could you comment a little bit on, you know, some of the decisions that you make about replacing technology? Clearly, you know, newer technology has new promises, new bells and whistles, new capabilities. How do you at both of your institutions, you know, make decisions about when to replace technology? And, and uh, you know, of course, um, you know, if, if as a manufacturer um, and a consumer, both, that's a somewhat different perspective. But maybe could you talk a little bit about um, 
how you evaluate technology, how you determine that it's time to re replace the system um, and what your major criteria are. For us, I would say we're constantly looking at, um, you know, ways to improve what we um, develop new systems. Um, and yeah. a lot of it is around software updates and upgrades. Um, for us with the mobile fleet, you know, we have experienced a lot of providers that have very aged equipment that mm -hmm. has come to end of life. You know, the parts and are, are no longer being produced and they're very hard to come by. So there's, there's a lot of, of that that we're experiencing and seeing out in the field. A lot of our service engineers, um, you know, have experienced that. I, I think that's a big part of Rod Sites, um, you know, and accreditation. I think it's holding facilities accountable to, to patient care and, uh, you know, making sure that we're not, it's not allowed to have extremely outdated equipment, you know, isn't providing the, the correct level of patient care that is expected. And I think that's a big piece of accreditation. What Radside's done is, um, you know, evaluating those systems and making sure that it, it's the right level of quality that is, is being judged and approved and accredited. Um, yeah. And as far as technology goes, you know, one thing that we've debated many times is should the criteria be based on physics parameters alone or right. should it be based on age of the equipment or should it be, um, you know, based on software upgrades? And so, you know, any thoughts or advice that you have, you know, from an accreditation perspective and clearly, you know, everybody wants to do best patient care um, you know, everybody, you know, has economic um, limitations as far as, you know, not buying new equipment constantly or right. upgrading maybe every time. And so, you know, what are th some of the thought processes and what would you recommend to um, RADSITE as an accreditation organization as far as what should our criteria be? We, we, we've seen scanners that are 25, 30 years old, mm -hmm. for example. And so should there be an age limitation or should it be based on performance? Should software be upgraded every you know, certain period of time? And, and what is that? Because anything that you know, we've talked about, each time it seems somewhat arbitrary. And there are those that say you know, age doesn't matter and it really just depends on how you perform. You know, I, I guess as some of our technologists or, or you know, nuclear medicine physicians might say, so yeah. how do you feel about that? I, I think that's a, a fair statement. I think that the physics piece is a, a big part of it. And there's some equipment that's been out there for a very long time, but if it's performing well and providing, you know, good quality images, then as long as it's the software's current and up to date, I, I don't, you know, I think, I think that's a good judge. Uh, a good judgment would be the physics testing and how, um, you know, if it's able to pass and provide that, that quality of care, then I, I, I don't see an issue. Yeah, I, I guess part of the challenge is when we do physics testing, it's really mainly pass or fail. Mm -hmm. But as you know, you know, the equipment starts getting closer and closer as time goes on, as, as it gets older, to maybe, you know, sort of just squeaking by as far as passing, but still passing. And yeah. I guess, you know, that, that really gets back to our standards. And so, you know, should a really old unit that's just barely passing be treated, you know, differently than, you know, a, a newer unit that, that's there. And, and so uh, I know there are really no answers to that, but I, I know that, you know, both of your um, companies uh, end up, you know, having to look at equipment replacement decisions all the time. And, you know, I, I certainly agree that if you can't get parts and a, and a system is sunset, it's clearly time to get another system. But, you know, figuring out how do you keep up with the latest and uh, greatest technology and, and um, you know, what do you decide that's safest for your patient? I know those are things you must struggle with. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's where we come in a lot of times, you know, if it's Mm -hmm. a lot of physicians might have that system, they're no longer able to get parts for. And and that's where, when we get that phone call, you know, to help and, and come in and provide that service on a mobile basis. So Mm -hmm. we experience it all the time. And from a mobile perspective, you know, I'm fascinated with the mobile market and, you know, have come over recent years to, you know, really appreciate some of the challenges associated with, with mobile. Could you talk, maybe both talk, if you've got some experience with mobiles, both of you, I I know, Angela, you've got extensive experience with some of the unique issues related to uh, mobiles. And, uh, you know, some of that might just be day-to-day issues or uh, some of it might be accreditation issues. Uh, But, you know, what do you see as the unique challenges for any groups that might be interested in, um, you know, moving to a a, a mobile environment? Yeah, I I think for us, we've been doing it for a a really long time. I think Mm -hmm. there's always going to be, um, with the mobile environment, there there's going to be some challenges. And at times, you know, you might have a down day every once in a while that that's just part of it. But, um, you know, knock on wood, we've, we've had a really, a really great, um, we don't have a, a ton of problems. We've got really good uptime, um, mm-hmm. you know, moving the equipment in and out every day. You've got the challenges of um, the technologist, you know, the location to the facility that we're going to, um, you know, just day-to-day issues. But overall, I think that we've, um, we've perfected it pretty well in all of the markets that we're in, you know, with, from a regulatory perspective, how we set up our, what we call hub locations. Um, Mm -hmm. And we we've got the system down as far as transporting the equipment. So I'd say the biggest challenges and we've worked with Gary a lot on this is, um, you know, getting some of the, insurance companies to recognize mobile imaging as not, you know, as a, a reputable um, service and, and not limiting, not limiting that um, mobile environment because it is, it's increasing um, the accessibility to care for a lot of these patients. Do you see mobile increasing or decreasing over the next five to 10 years? I think increasing for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that one of the big trends in medicine has been point of care delivery or mm-hmm. uh, has been delivery for patients at home or probably more practically in, in nuclear medicine environments and, you know, rehab centers, for example, nursing homes and, <clears throat> you know, not quite in an outpatient imaging facility, not quite in a hospital. Right. And then, you know, certainly uh, shared services. Also, do you think that the, there's a different type of technologist that would do mobile or, or do you really not see a, a distinction between the two? It, you know, are, are most technologists pretty much, you know, okay with mobile or, or non-mobile or is it a, kind of a different quote unquote breed of tech? That yeah, does, uh, mobile? that's a great question. And I think a lot of our um, technologists have left the hospital environment you know typically Mm -hmm. we don't experience a lot of new grads because they are working independently you know not in that um, lab environment where they've got someone else who can answer questions or help them you know so they've got typically a little more experience where if if the system goes down they're able to troubleshoot you know they're they um work very well independently and don't have that need for backup kind of is, Mm -hmm. is our experience. And and then as far as recruiting new mobile techs, that would suggest to me that, you know, it it might be something where you look at other technologists who are doing mobile. I, I, I would imagine that most technologists coming out of school would probably be, as you sort of implied, maybe a little hesitant to do mobile. Yeah, traditionally that that is true, and we've um, you know we're willing to to provide more training, you know, to get them comfortable. We've increased um, 
accessibility to resources for them. Uh, but we we do not hesitate in hiring, you know, new grad technologists. We just right. have, we understand <laughs> that there's going to be a little more training involved to make them comfortable in that mobile environment. If you were giving advice to technologists coming out of school, would you um, recommend mobile or, or non-mobile? Yeah, I think it, it's dependent on the individual. I think okay. for our mobile environment, it they still get to provide that patient care that you know they long to do. However, you're, yes. you get to experience different environments and develop different relationships with a variety of practices. So okay. uh, in addition to no weekends or nights or holidays or calls, so <laughs> it, it's a great a lot of benefits to the mobile environment. Yeah, interesting. And are salaries pretty similar? Yeah, I would say yes. Okay. You have to. That's the only way to keep up with the market. Yeah, and as time goes on, it it seems as though salaries have been spiraling upwards a a bit. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I want to use sort of the, last few minutes that we have to talk a little bit about regulatory issues. You want to, Julie, advance to the next slide? Great. So um, could you all, could you both comment a little bit on your perspectives as far as new radiopharmaceuticals? I can tell you as a nuclear medicine physician, you know, it's kind of frustrating to read about all of these different really cool studies that are being done and, you know, really positive results. And yet we just don't have access to so many of them. Could you maybe talk about that a little bit and then maybe payment as well? Well, I can touch base a little bit on the regulatory side. So we have introduced a lot of the new radio pharmaceuticals into our you know, regular practice already. Um, what I did see um, as far as changing some of our licenses is that our regulatory agencies really needed a little bit of education to bring them up to speed as to what we were asking um, authorizations for. So. Some of our, uh, I can think of a couple specific state regulatory agencies that basically had no idea what we were asking for. And then, and, you know, until I provided them enough information to allow us to, you know, get those copper drugs on the license, they, they were hesitant to do that. So I think, you know, it's new for everybody and it's kind of a learning experience as we, as we move forward. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, how about any other regulatory issues that you've run into? And we haven't seen too many um, with the, the new radio pharmaceuticals. Um, and the only one I could really think of offhand is in in the mobile environment with some of those copper drugs. We're holding the waste a little bit longer, but it's really not a okay. large enough volume that it's become a problem. Let's put it that way. Um, okay. It is something to consider, but it really is some, it's something we can work with. And then how about um, issues related to uh, um, payment um, with regard to, you know, CMS and insurers, et cetera? Um, you know, do you, what do you think about the system currently? And, you know, are your, you know, companies both, you know, looking at mechanisms to be able to sort of, you know, improve the payment situation or, you know, educate some of the payers about the uh, tremendous value of uh, the nuclear medicine pharmaceuticals that are are just coming out now? Well, I think, yeah, I think all of those things. And in addition, even on the local level, you know, our teams are working with the referrers to help educate them um, on appropriate use criteria to make sure that they're um, using those guidelines to order the the correct test for their patients as well. Mm-hmm. Any other comments on that? And not for me, no. Okay. And then I guess one other comment that I had or question that I had was, what do you see the role or the potential of an accreditation organization such as RadSite with regard to, um, you know, helping out patients and helping out, you know, your companies and helping out with nuclear medicine in general. I mean, how can an accreditation organization that, you know, sort of sets the standards 
for personnel, sets the standards for equipment, sets um, standards for um, facilities. You know, are there suggestions that you have for us or that you could feedback where we might be able to, you know, talk about this in the standards committee or the accreditation committee? You know, any any hints or things that that you'd like to see? I, I know many of people, many people have suggested that accreditation really can, you know, raise the bar as far as uh, you know, trying to maintain patient safety, reduce patient dose, you know, make sure that scanners that shouldn't be in operation, you know, are are indeed not in operation. But any suggestions that either of you have to uh, Rad Site as an accreditation organization? Not so much a suggestion, but I just did want to agree with all of those points that you just touched on. And for a nationwide company, okay. I think it really helps to standardize things in all different areas across the, you know, such a large geographic area. Um, and when you have different centers working in different places, you know, maybe they were, they came from acquisitions. And when you merge some things together like that, sometimes it's really good to have that accrediting body to help yeah. you standardize things across the board. It really is very mm -hmm. helpful. Thanks. Yeah. And, and any other comments? Yeah, I, I just echo, you know, what, what you and Kay have said. I think that yep. RadSite has been a great partner for us. Um, and I do think that the, the standards and holding everyone to those standards has been a, a great benefit to, to the patients, you know, overall. Yeah. Well, I do have well, a, thanks. a question from the question oh. and answer as well, if, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah, thank you. No, please. So the question is, what about RSNA's QIBA Kiva effort regarding the FCG PET CT biomarker? What is the intent here, and is it worth the extra cost? Yeah, so if you both will permit me, let me try and take a crack at, at answering that question. Um, so QIBA, or, or Kiva, stands for Quantitative Imaging biomarkers aligned. And um, it really is an effort that grew out of the National Cancer Institute. Um, Dan Sullivan was a colleague of mine and um, he kicked it off. I, I was present at some of the early meetings and I think part of you know what was really important was the whole idea in doing clinical trials of making sure that if you're testing a piece of, you know, if you're testing a, a type of technical approach from a uh, imaging perspective, or if you're testing a radiopharmaceutical, then it's really important to have standardization. If you've got people doing clinical trials and you've got different institutions that are scanning using different um, techniques and you know, uh, are not standardizing the way that they're making their measurements and that you have you know, the potential for the same patient in different um, scanners, to have different measurements that are made, it really um, makes doing clinical trials very difficult and it, it makes the results questionable. And really the basic premise of the KIPA effort is those terrific efforts that have been done to try to standardize clinical, uh, to try to standardize clinical trials should be applied in routine clinical practice. So then when we talk about um, PET um, scanning, it, pretty notoriously, um, it turns out that uh, people are seeing different SUV values um, on the same patient um, on the same day, you know, being scanned if you put them in multiple scanners. And so SUV values can notoriously vary from one machine to another, one center to another. In fact, to the point where people, you know, often suggest having the patient done on the same scanner. But even the same scanner can change and drift over time. And also, you know, the question is, I mean, if we're all measuring different SUV values and they're suggesting that we scan on the same patient, it raises the question of what is the accuracy of SUV right. determinations? And so, you know, the KIPA effort really creates a checklist of about 30 items or so. And it says, if you can meet these 30 items in this list of questions, then it's pretty likely that your measurements for SUC, SUV are accurate. And if those measurements are accurate, it probably doesn't matter as much which scanner you get um, scanned on. And so in Europe, they uh, actually signed up quite a few um, 
nuclear medicine imaging departments and uh, um, looked at a variety of different levels of compliance with that checklist as far as self-attestation, asking the sites, you know, to what extent are you already in compliance and how hard would it be to, to do that? Rad site um, initiated that in the US and collected data from a few of our sites um, looking at, you know, what are the challenges in meeting some of those criteria, how motivated, you know, are sites to meet those criteria? And, you know, should we think about incorporating some of those criteria into our, you know, basic accreditation requirements as well? So it's really very much designed, you know, with patients in mind to try and make measurements um, as accurate as possible. And as you all know, you know, the difference between determining whether a, a chemotherapy or radiation therapy or other treatment is successful or not is often judged based on increases or decreases in MTV. And the fact that it can vary just because of the difference in machine or site or technique that's used or even, you know, within a particular one machine, I, I think that really calls into question you know, particularly some of the small changes in SUV because we don't really have an era of measurement. So I'm really super enthusiastic about the Kiva efforts in nuclear medicine, it's SUV and uh, it's volume determination for um, CT scans of the thorax. And, you know, there are also ones for ultrasound and also, um, you know, uh, Kiva um, checklists for um, MRI as well. So uh, thanks for the question. And it's something I'm really enthusiastic about increasing efforts for routine clinical scanning to make them of similar quality, particularly with regard to variation from one system to the other. So thanks. Any other comments on that or any other questions? Okay, well, it looks like we've come to the uh, end of the hour. But, um, you know, I can't um, thank you, you know, enough, Angela and Kay, for participating and, and sharing, you know, both of your really, you know, unique perspectives um, and uh, sharing a little bit about, you know, what is cool and exciting today, where we're going, some of the ways people are, are coping with those uh, challenges. And so, uh, you know, thanks again for your time and for your expertise and your support. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much, Julie. I think I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, and in closing, Rads, I would like to say thank you to our moderator, Dr. Elliot Siegel, and our panelists, Angela Graber and Kay Castle. If you do have additional questions, feel free to contact us at info at radsitequality.com and we will forward it on to whoever in the panel could answer it best and respond back to you. Just a reminder that today's webinar has been recorded and will be available through our website in the next day or so. If you enjoyed this presentation, please be sure to check out our webinar page on our website for past webinar recordings. We hope you will continue to join us for upcoming webinars. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.